2nd of January, 2001, Latham Headquarters. Interviewer is Lieutenant Colonel Robert Von Hassan. Mr. O'Connor, tell me about where you were born and grew up. Well, I was born on October 7, 1923 in Schenectady, New York. And uh, came from a nice Irish family, downtown Schenectady. Ten children, my mother and father, my grandmother lived with us. And a uh, very, very fortunate existence. Uh, the family was good. And uh, went to parochial high school in Schenectady and graduated. It took me about six years to find out I had a Regents diploma. When I applied for college after the war, I thought I just had a general diploma and applied to be an advertising artist and a dean. So that's the way I wound up. World War II was extremely fortunate for me. I came out much further ahead than what I contributed, I feel. So now, where were you exactly when you I was in Schenectady and uh, drafted from Board 356 down the Central Fire Station. Uh, actually, when uh, I was drafted, it was the first contingent that was drafted when the uh, law went to 18-year-olds from the 21-year-olds. And grabbed a whole bunch of two older ones to fill up the quota. And we all went down to uh, Camp Upton, Long Island. You want me to st start my story in a way? Mm -hmm. But I'd like to back up for a second, because you were a young man in Schenectady uh, before you were drafted. What was the war like in Schenectady? Uh, I waited to be drafted rather than enlist. Many, many of the kids are enlisting. They couldn't wait to get into the action. Um, but I didn't want to enlist and regret. I'll wait to be drafted and take my chances and do what I have to do and serve the way I have to serve. Uh, so we had worked, uh, I worked for Army Ordnance and um, American Locomotive Company just when I was drafted, building tanks. And I thought, sure, when I went into service, I'd wind up in the tank corps because of that background. But that isn't the way the Army works. I probably should have made me a cook. But... Um, my other fellows, friends, uh, one had a year of college in, the other one had a uh, general electric apprentice course, and the other one was down at GE. Most everybody was working at GE at the time. It was changed in January 43 for all us 18-year-olds. We had a very unique outfit, though. Uh, they were all drafted from Plattsburgh down to New York City and from New York City out to Montauk Point. We had every town represented. We had 22 from Schenectady mm -hmm. in my company. Mm -hmm. And uh, we stayed together for three years, which was also very unique. And we never got home on a furlough in three years. So all those, I keep saying the uniqueness of our outfit, my every outfit was unique, but not quite as, as ours was. We went in the same day, went through the same training, went through the same battles came home on the same ship, got discharged the same day, and rode home on the same train. And that's a little bit different. That's your first uh, yeah. duty station. Yeah. What was that like? <laughs> that was an experience. Three days. Fortunately, we were only there a short time, and uh, just enough time to get our shots and our orientation and our uniforms and pull KP maybe once. And then uh, on the troop train down to Texas for three days. It took three days to go down. The, that was a good ride down to Texas. And when we got off the train in Texas, we stood there cold, January 19th, 1943. We said, what are they train here? The guy says, MPs. MPs? Oh, man. We, we weren't happy. None of us wanted to be MPs. Why not? We all wanted to be pilots. We all wanted to be in the Air Force. That's where the promotions, that's where the glory was. Uh, we didn't want to be in infantry, and I don't think I wanted to be in tanks. But we thought quartermaster, ordnance, or artillery, uh, but not MPs. But in retrospect, it was a really good assignment. It worked out real well. I had an extremely interesting job in Naples. I was in headquarters and did all kinds of investigations um, for over two and a half years. I know Naples as well as I know Schenectady. Um, it was a good assignment for me because I wound up in headquarters. Mm -hmm. And I wound up in headquarters because I got pneumonia in southern Italy and wound up in a British hospital for two weeks. And then they put me in an American hospital for two weeks. And discharged, I called the 
headquarters and said I want to have somebody come up and pick me in the hospital because if uh, they sent me to replacement depot I could wind up at the infantry and I wasn't excited. It was a very difficult winter that winter of 44 in Italy. Um, so uh, they said well don't worry about that we are in headquarters now so they went up and picked me up and came down. Uh, Naples was an interesting city to serve in at that time with the war. I think of 103rd, 106th, 117th, the 45th general, the 23rd, just in the city. Five hospitals, you know, taking care of the wounded from Anzio and Casino and those battles. We were filling them up pretty good. Well, they put them on the ships as fast as they could send them to the States, but uh, they, they were pretty busy. Let's go back to Texas. Okay. You tell me about your uh, training. Well, it was, uh, it was a good uh, time in Texas. Uh, And then we went through some three or four months of special um, military police training regarding prisoners of war and uh, transporting prisoners and traffic control. Um, I went to a map school, which is one of the reasons I got into headquarters. Uh, I could type, I could drive a military vehicle, and I was considered a battalion artist, so those things uh, didn't hurt me. Um, and we guarded a stockade in the... Um, Camp Swift, Texas. That was not a happy occurrence. We had a very difficult colonel that ran that Texas uh, stockade, and he wasn't the most compassionate person in the world. Concentration uh, camp, they used to call it, but mm. it was a tough, a tough assignment. How so? Uh, he, uh, he had a lot of vicious people that worked in. As you know now, some people gravitate toward it. There are good people in it, of course. But um, the stockade, uh, some of our guys would go to town and go to the stockade, the next day we'd see him carrying. He did some very violent things, uh, treating the prisoners. Uh, we had the same thing in Italy when we guarded the stockade in Italy. Uh, another camp commander of a stockade. Must be a unique individual that uh, they put in charge of stockade commandants. Uh, that's the way it works. They're very hard and uh, they're very, not very compassionate, as I said. What you saw in the stockade bomb? Yeah, we tried to be, um, um, we were New Yorkers and we treated them um, as New Yorkers treated. The, the black-white issue was coming to fore. We'd go into town, we'd be pulling town duty and uh, the people would line up for the bus, an American soldier happening to be black would be in the front, and the bus driver would tell them to get to the rear. And uh, we couldn't see that. We couldn't understand that as, as New Yorkers. And we say, no, he's an American soldier. Well, we were following our laws here. And we saw this issue come to pass uh, throughout the war, uh, which I refer to in my letters, that a lot of things uh, are going to have to be sorted out, which they have sorted out in the last 50 years. But uh, a lot of things uh, we learned, we were learning quickly then, 19-year-olds, 18-year-olds, and we're seeing the real world, not just in the eyes of a country kid from New York. How'd you get along with the, um, the rest of the New Yorkers in your office? It must have been very interesting. Well, yeah, <laughs> we had a lot from Corona, Long Island. Had They cleaned out city blocks when they drafted them. There was a whole bunch of Italian. Our cadre came from Minnesota, Fort Schnelling, Minnesota, and our medics came from Illinois, and uh, they thought we were smart, smart aleck New York. Brotherly, very close, very close. Um, the New York City boys, we, we didn't treat them uh, like one kid saved my life, and we were, I still get together with him, Tony D'Amelio from uh, Corona, Long Island. What a hell of a kid he was. He went and got the medics for me when I had pneumonia in Italy, and I credit him with saving my life. Mm. So we, we still have dinner with him in Florida now. But uh, they, they turned out to be good, pretty good kids. Well, what was it like being in the South? I mean, the, from upstate well, New uh, we liked Austin, Texas. It was kind of nice. We, uh, and then I was in this map school, and we'd go swimming. We'd, we'd do map studies in the morning and draw military maps on.
and uh, prayed a little. We didn't care to go to town that much, actually. The, the camp had everything we needed, the movies and entertainment, and uh, we didn't we didn't t go to town that much. Uh, there that long, actually, seven months, and most of the time we were quarantined for one reason or another. So it was a good hitch in, in Texas, and we were glad to get on the train, but had no idea where we were going. And uh, there were all kinds of rumors. One of the funny stories was that the little kid from the Bronx, Marty Brodsky, uh, we're all guests. duty in Washington, D.C., we're going to guard the Capitol, we're going to go to this and that. And Marty Brodsky in the, st in the post exchange one day says, I hear we're going to Camp Shanks, New York. Well, the MPs grabbed him, took him into headquarters to quiz him. Where'd you find out? Find out what? Where we're going. Well, right away, then we knew where well, that's where we're going. Well, it's a city and through Buffalo. And coming from Buffalo over to Albany, we uh, all wanted to volunteer on the doors so that we could see Schenectady. We went through. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, we cut from Amsterdam and came out down in Selkirk, and we missed Schenectady. And we saw a couple of cows, and the guy says, hey, there's, there's Schenectady. <laughs> so, uh, we, in Selkirk, we stopped. Uh, I guess the train had to get some water. And one of the kids' uh, father had worked in the Selkirk switching yards. So he said, tell my, tell my dad that I'm on my way overseas. So we went down to Camp Shanks, and then none of us got home. None mm -hmm. of us got home. But all the New York City kids, at night, uh, they were going AWOL every night, and they'd get back by 6 in the morning. One night, out of 170 guys, 110 were AWOL. And the, and the lieutenant says, geez, I just hope they're all back in the morning. In fact, one platoon, they put us on marching back and forth just to keep us busy. And back and forth and back and forth. They finally get column right, turn right, over the tracks, they all went. <laughs> the whole platoon went AWOL into the city. They all were from Queens and Brooklyn and New York City, but they all may not have made the ship. But then we got aboard the ship and Africa. That was a nice ride, two weeks. A little frightening, actually. Oh, so? Well, we were in the, uh, the lower hold of the ship. It was a car, the um, Dorothea L. Dix. I, I've been collecting the ship. It was, I don't know if she was some uh, do-gooder. Mm -hmm. And uh, they named the ship after her. And we're in the bottom hold. And if we got torpedoed, we didn't have a prayer. So we, my three buddies and I, stayed up, up above all most of two o'clock in the morning. We'd stay up there playing cards and talking and uh, having good times. And I got to tell you, you want a little anecdotes? Sure. <laughs> the one guy was going with a girl, and he was deeply in love. And the other guy. Much. He saw her a couple of times. So going over in a boat, they get in a discussion on who's going to get married first. And he says, oh, no, he says, well, says you're going to be married first. He says, uh, I can bet you that. So no, no. He said, no, I'm not going to get married first. And I don't want to use names. but um, So he says, well, I'll bet you $25 you're going to be married first. And um, OK, so they dry up, drop a contract written and, and um, well, Bud and I, we witness it, we sign our names somewhere in the high seas. This is just something to do. So, uh, and then he says, I'll give you a chance to get your $25 back. He says, oh yeah, he says, you're going to marry so-and-so. Oh no, he said, no way. Okay, draw up another contract, we all signed that. Gee, it came to pass, the guy, he, he called it, he got married first, and he married the one the guy said he was married, and at the wedding, we were all at the wedding, he said, what am I doing with the $50? He says, you're going to pay me. He says, I said, give it to him as a wedding present, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a cute story, though. And he, he kept the contract. The one guy kept the contract for the three years. But uh, then we got to North Africa, and uh, uh, we were happy to get there safely after two weeks. And uh, well, the, the war in Africa had ended about three months before. and I think it was around March or April of forty. War was ended, and um, we were there in September. Uh, the people were throwing roses, and there's the trucks coming through, as if, as if we were new. 
it was, that was not a good duty for a month. The guard and the prisoner of war, uh, the 100,000 Italian and uh, German prisoners of war. One of the main jobs we had each day was march them out to the Mediterranean. And, uh, but they would march for hours and hours. You need about five, five MPs guarding 25,000 troops because they had no place to go. They couldn't escape. We were right on the edge of the desert. So. They were happy to be prisoners, most of them. Few of them, uh, the, some of the hard-nosed Germans are tough, but uh, most of them were very happy that their war was over. And they, they were going to go from there to the states and, uh, you know, prisoner war camps in the United States at the time, all over the country, I guess they have. <coughs> Did you have any problems with the, uh, the hardcore Germans? Uh, well, at all. The, the, the war mock, uh, the, General, uh, we, we, we admired their discipline, their abilities, their fighting spirit. We, we, we admired them as the soldiers, and they were most, in most cases, they were pretty up and up, and they followed the International Tribunal on, uh, what do they call it, military justice or code of military warfare? Yeah, well, well, well. Most of them followed, except the Malmedy massacre and those type of things, and then the SS troops that uh, the Ardentine massacre in Rome, which my buddy and I went in and helped liberate. Uh, those type of uh, occurrences, uh, we didn't care for the SS troops at all. Uh, the other troops, they did their job as they believed in it. And uh, we did ours. So we were lucky. How long were you in North Africa? Pardon? How long were you in North Africa? Only about a month. Only about a month. And then. Uh, we got aboard our troop ship and headed for Italy, and Sicily was just being invaded there. They're moving up through Sicily fast. And uh, we waited in Bizzurti Harbor for maybe a day or two and then went straight across to Naples, and they unloaded us in Naples, and we landed by Higgins boats on the beach because uh, we still mined. Naples had just fallen <coughs> about... There was supposedly October 1st, 1943, there were four days of street fighting when the partisans... And then we came in on the 6th, and... Cayano College outside of Naples. University of Naples. And we moved from there on out. And then our, our campaign started. Those were the worst days of our war. It was from October 6th, 43, to June 44, when we took Rome. To see the artillery, and we could hear the artillery. We were 10 miles behind, so we were somewhat safe. But we had a lot of, uh, a lot of air raids, um, landmines, strafing, and that sort of thing. Just enough to, up close enough to not have to wear a tie, uh, and uh, and not have to salute, and not close enough to get killed, <laughs> somewhat. Well, this time you were still guarding prisoners of war. Uh, no, it, we, in the Naples we were uh, at all kinds of duties, uh, traffic control mostly, and uh, the port uh, to guard the shipping that was coming into the port. Naples was really handy traffic into Naples than, um, than New York City. Uh, we're supplying the American 5th Army and the British 8th Army. Uh, plenty of plenty of traffic, so that was a major, uh, major job there. And then we had some interesting experiences that we, uh, at one time they were uh, drying out gunpowder that was going up the lines damp and it was misfiring. And they were, Naples was loaded with tunnels, which they used as the recoveros, the, the air raid shelters. And they were putting all this munitions down there to dry it out, and they caught fire when they started exploding and blowing holes right through the ground and killing people. So they called out our battalion. We had to clear out a whole section of Naples, just tell them, Andare via, via Roma, Vatin, Vatin, via Roma. You know, and we didn't know, that's all we knew how to say. Mm -hmm. And then they'd say, Perché, Perché, why, why? We couldn't, we couldn't, uh, we didn't have that much Italian, we couldn't tell them why. 
But so we kicked them all out and put them down there. And then another time we had to uh, clear out the city when they reconnected the power up. The uh, Germans had really messed up the power. We were afraid it was all uh, uh, timed bomb. You know, uh, streets had blown up two weeks later. The post office blew up two weeks later. Uh, they had detonation up to about three weeks. That was a danger too. Buildings were blowing up. And, so we didn't know what would blow up, so we had to clear out the city again. A lot of black market, a lot of armed robbery, a lot of, we had everything. It was a real, real tough city at the time. What was it like getting along with the Italians? Well, they, uh, we had so many Italians in our outfit, uh, they were very receptive to the American troops coming in. Um, had so many relatives. Uh, you know, kids were looking up their relatives. Uh, I had some very interesting stories of um, second generation Italians that came over and wound up in the, serving in the Italian campaign. And one kid uh, inherited some property and he went to his, he was in the infantry up on the lines, he went to his officer and says, I'd like to get a three day pass and go down to Reggio Calabria, southern Italy to, to uh, straighten out this, uh, uh, inheritance I have and he also says well I can't be your personal legal man he says we can't give you a, there were no furloughs you could have TDY temporary duty or a change in station or something but you couldn't have a furlough in Italy mm -hmm. so this kid was over the hill and he was just going to go for a weekend to get a lawyer to take care of his property and then two days wound up to three and three wound up to be a week a week wound up to be a month and 13 months later he gets we get a letter in our headquarters that there's an American deserter in southern Italy. He was just by some poison pen relatives that threw him in. And so I said, to, I assigned a couple of MPs. I was in charge of this investigation. And I said, you want to go down and look up this guy? So they go down in southern Italy and they go into this barber shop and there's this kid cutting hair. He says, I guess you've come for me. And the MP says, yeah, we have. Can I finish this guy? He says, okay, finish, finish his haircut. He said, can I say goodbye to my wife? Your wife? Yeah, he had gotten married. He was running for mayor for the town. And he was an American soldier that had left a year, been out of there a year. Had all kinds of Italian identification. Uh, he was a real nice kid. And he had had his belly fill. He had fought through Africa, fought through Sicily, and up and through Italy. And when he got into Italy and wound up with relatives and friends, he, he decided he had enough. So uh, we brought him back up to Naples. Actually, we brought his wife up to and put her up in a hotel and treated her pretty decent. He was a pretty decent kid, so. There were some, a lot of those stories. They were very interesting stories. Tell us more. Well, I had a kid, uh, Pete Ciminelli. He was a professional gambler from Chicago. And he was at headquarters of our MP battalion. How he got there, you know, <laughs> He, uh, he went AWOL, he had ser served his time, he fought through Sicily, up through Salerno, and up on the lines, and he went over the hill. And he made his living playing poker in, in the Red Cross in Naples every day. And, you know, <coughs> there was a poker game, and he had all kinds of forged documents. But anyway, he steps off a curb one day, and he almost gets hit by a Jeep, and he, he cusses out the Jeep driver, you dirty bitch, you know? And he turns around, and he says, what does this Italian call him? And they bring him in investigate him. They find out he's an American soldier, been they wall about a year. And he said, so they, they court-martialed him, they give him time, they put him in the stockade. Well, at that time, there were so many people in the stockade for offenses that they would bring him up before a board to try to uh, re, re, uh, rejuvenate some of their service and say, could you serve? You know, he said, yeah, I'll serve. He said, but I put my time in the infantry and I know my number is coming up. He says, put me in anything. So they put him in a, a hospital out there. <coughs> the hospital closes, and they're going to put him back in the infantry. He said, put me back in the infantry, I'm going to go AWOL again. So they put him in the MPs. They put him in our outfit. Well, he was a real asset to us because he knew Naples. He knew all the criminals and all the background of everything. And uh, he, uh, he stayed with us until he went. Well, I went back to Italy in 66. <coughs> <coughs> with my family, and I ran into a couple uh, Italians that I ran in, uh, had worked with, Italian police. And I said, uh, we went by this little uh, place in, in Naples. 
Santa Lucia, and I looked at a guy and I said, Cheese Flow, I think I know that guy. And she said, Well, why don't you ask? I said, Well, I kind of feel funny. I said uh, to one of the girls, Come see Gamma Kusum Persona. He says, Le uh, Picciarelli. I said, Giuseppe. And he turned around and said, Hey, Caparos. And we had worked together 20 years ago. And so I said, oh. So we had a good visit. And then uh, he took me to another guy that uh, we had worked with, another Italian policeman. And um, I said, they see any of the guys, any of them? Like everybody? He said, no, just Pete Ciminelli. Pete Ciminelli? I says, he stayed in the military? Oh, yeah. He says, what the heck? He could make a living playing poker because he was a professional gambler. And he could do things with cards you wouldn't believe. You still wouldn't believe him. He, he, he flipped the cards up. They came up face up. And he's going like this for a few minutes and telling us, anytime the cards in a poker game come face up, he says, get out of the game. He said, because there's something wrong. Really, Pete? Yeah, oh yeah. So he shuffles the card, cut, cut. He deals out the hands. You wouldn't believe the hands he dealt. He had stacked the cards while he was telling us this story. He had stacked them. And, and uh, he could handle the chips, you know. You never count them. You give me 23, you go, and he just measured them. He'd just go like this. He was a real professional gambler. And he stayed in the military, made a living, made a bundle. But, so it was interesting. Yeah. At what point did you um, end up in the hospital? I was in the hospital a few times. Uh, I had an infected athlete's foot and some other stuff. I had x-ray therapy in one hospital and outside of Naples. But the uh, pneumonia I got down in Castellamar, which is south of Naples, when they were loading for Anzio, we were pulling guard duty on the docks, uh, guarding the ships that were loading for Anzio. and. Um, I, I came off guard duty and I was chilled and feverish and everything and the guys didn't believe me and they thought I was goofing off and didn't want to go back on and so this my buddy Tony D'Amelio says he's really sick I'm going to go get the medics and I said no oh, Tony I'll be all right I'll be okay no I'm going to get the medics so I was out of it for three days and the nearest hospital was a British hospital so they took me there for uh, two weeks I was in the British hospital and then they transferred me up to American hospital and uh, in Naples, and they did a good job. It was uh, really quite a hitch. But the British hospital has, they censored one letter. They used to, they were marvelous uh, caregivers. They, uh, as I understand it, uh, the British medics that worked in the wards were uh, reclaimed combat people, and they really appreciated the job. The American medics, they were, so so they say hey you take care of it yourself you give me some water you can get it yourself you know they weren't as compassionate uh, to uh, the patients as the british seemed to be they used to make me a pot of coffee every day every day they had tea and four times a day and they say yank you want some tea i said man they don't i don't care for tea that much you like coffee don't you i said well i'd rather have coffee than tea so they used to make me a pot of coffee every day i was the only american there <laughs> so it's cute had, a, had an interesting one happen uh, well, Flo and I went to uh, London in 89 and I got talking to these two old women about the Battle of Britain and they were celebrating uh, the Battle of Britain and they showed this uh, program from Westminster Abbey and I said, oh gee, that's very nice. She said, you can have it. I said, oh, I don't want to take your program. Maybe she said, you can share it with your buddies. I said, well, that's very nice of you. So Flo said, let me take your picture with these two women. So she takes my picture, and I say to him, if, uh, if the picture comes out, I'd like to send you a copy. She says, oh, okay. So she gives me her address in London, Pat Hawes, and all her address. And when I get back, the pictures are quite cute. In fact, I still have them. And uh, so I mailed them two pictures. Um, at Christmas time, she sends me a Christmas card. I don't know how fast I could find those pictures. Uh, she sends me a picture of uh, a memorial plot that she planted for Bill O'Connor and his army buddies from World War II uh, in the Field of Remembrance. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know where. It must be in the other one. So anyway, it, um, it was quite touching. You know, the whole plot had gone to Bill O'Connor and his army buddies from New York. Ooh. It was neat. It's, uh, yeah. Let's go back to Naples. Um, what were some of your other duties there? After you got out of the hospital, you went to the Well, headquarters. I went into headquarters. I drove for a while. I drove a, a two and a half ton truck uh, for um, supplies. Uh, 
Well, it intrigues me about the war at that time, the amount of supplies that would go in. And every outfit drawing supplies for a thousand men a day. How many men do we have? Uh, we only had about 800. But they would draw the supplies, and then the company would break, the battalion would break them down into four companies and give a little extra for headquarters. And then the mail, uh, getting the mail moved up. Uh, the war scene is interesting. That kind of war scene was extremely interesting, supply wise, logistics. Because the battles are one thing, but there's about 10 or 15 guys behind there supplying the ordnance and the artillery and the, everything else. Some very interesting stories. Uh, one case I investigated, well, I turned it over to CIC, the Counterintelligence Corps, because this didn't, we didn't deal with the, the, the battalion. Our battalion was the Provo Marshal military control of Naples at the time. Um, they had the CID, which is the Criminal Investigation Division, which is a notch higher than ours, would be like the FBI. And then the CIC was a counterintelligence corps, that would be espionage and that sort of thing. Um, we get a photograph, comes across my desk, there's a P-38, a brand new P-38, that some lieutenant had defected and flown just above the Anzio line to a German airfield and turned it over and gave it in to the Germans. Brand new P-38. And um, this doesn't seem almost plausible, it doesn't seem believable, but he was ticked off that he didn't get promoted to captain. And the strange part was a month or two later, his promotion did come through to captain. But the more interesting part was I met a photographer after the war from Schenectady that was in the outfit that that P-38 was assigned to, and it was a brand new P-38 that they had flown over from the States, or brought over from the States, and was the, the colonel's plane. And this guy had turned it over to the Germans. But this guy verified my story. Now most of them know about that story, because it just uh, they were pulling guard duty or something. One of the bad uh, assignments our company had, D Company, uh, was guarding the prisoners um, in the stockade were mostly American prisoners. They did guard a few German prisoners, uh, war criminals, and they hung a couple. They hung a, and they hung a few Americans uh, for rape in, in the stockade at the time. And they had to fall out and witness these things. People don't know those stories occurred. They hung, uh, they hung a few American soldiers and a German. And he was given autographed pictures to our guys. It's interesting uh, that those things aren't even written about, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Did you have to fall out to witness that? No, time? no. But I had a captain in our outfit. He was a Texan, San Antonio Texan. Oh, we're going to hang a big one today, about 220 pounds. He couldn't wait to go out and see that. Mm -hmm. And he'd go out to the stockade first thing in the morning to witness oh. that hanging. And it was a little gruesome to me. No, I didn't have to. The, these, the other guys in our, uh, our my four buddies, uh, three buddies did. But th that was an awful assignment, that uh, stockade thing. You know. They had that uh, very vicious uh, commandant. And he was, he wouldn't, he wouldn't uh, authorize medicine for the guys with venereal disease. Uh, he said, they, they got it, let them pay the price. And you know, this sort of thing. He was a real tough cookie. And we had a real good medic from Rock Island, Illinois, who I also looked up after the war. I would call him Doc Potter. He had been two years in medical school and two years as a pharmacist in the Navy. And he was really knowledgeable medical-wise. And he really wanted to uh, go after this guy after the war. But he, you know, it's all forgotten when you get home and let it go. In fact, General Mark Clark wasn't too well revered by the 5th Army troops. The 36th Division took an awful pasting five times across the rivers and got thrown back every time, and they wanted to court-martial Mark Clark, too. That didn't go anywhere, either. Uh, Doc Potter told another cute anecdote going over. He was, I didn't find this story out until we got back on our honeymoon. My wife and I stopped in Rock Island, Illinois, 49 years ago and visited Doc Potter. We go out to his country club. I didn't know he was a millionaire. He was only a sergeant in our outfit. He owned a bowling alley and two ice cream parlors, and he was head of the VA for 22 counties in Illinois. And so I called him up. I said, hey, Doc, this is Bill O'Connor. Oh, boy, 
come on over, we'll go out to good dinner. So we, he take us out to his country club where the Western Open was being played. It was really posh, and we were, <laughs> we were on a budget of <laughs> peanuts. So anyway, we get at the bar, and we're, we're talking about war stories, and he tells me how he was court-martialed going overseas on this Dorothy L. Dick ship for mutiny on the high seas. That's what the charge was. But it was <laughs> a stupid story. And the guy that caused it was a guy named Ferris from Texas, who was a, who was a sergeant, and uh, he was a sergeant in the detail. And we had us give names uh, for KP in the morning, going over in the ship. Good, uh, so anyway, going over in the ship, he, uh, he assigns Potter to go on KP in the morning. And Potter gets up, he was a corporal at the time, and he gets up in the morning, he says, you know, I don't have to go on KP, I'm a corporal. He said, Potter, you go on KP. Okay, so he goes down and he reports to KP, and the, the guy on the ship says, you know, I don't have your name listed here, so you can't eat breakfast before. So he says, I don't care what you do, go back to your boat. So he goes back to his bunk, and uh, the next morning, Ferris tells him again, I told you, Potter, you go down on KP today. He says, I'm not going to serve KP, I'm a corporal, I don't have to pull KP. But he says, you go down there, you'll be in charge if he was down there, and they, they, wouldn't, um, they wouldn't serve him again, so they send him back. So the third time he does it, Potter refuses to go down. He says, I'm not going down. He says, you're just trying to break up my sleep. He says, you refusing an order from a non-commissioned officer? He says, yeah, I'm refusing you. He says, okay, you're under arrest. They get guards, they put him under arrest. He's on mutiny on the high seas. <laughs> it's almost hilarious. So they bring him up on charges, and they have him arrested for two days before the captain can hear the, the charges. Well, Potter happened to have a lot of influence, and there was an artillery outfit on our ship going over, and uh, he had a, uh, an officer in that outfit that he asked to be his legal counsel. So the, 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 the legal counsel comes up, and they come before the captain, and when they tell the story, the captain couldn't believe this stupid story is transpiring. He says, how long you been a sergeant? He said, I've been a sergeant, three years. He said, three years too long, case dismissed. <laughs> so I threw it out. And um, Potter was telling me this story out in Rock Island, Illinois, about five, ten years after the war. You hear an awful lot of stories after the war that you never knew happened. Like our one company, we understand they got a third battle star because they were up in the Pole Valley. So when the points came out, we're going to get discharged. Uh, they decide that uh, they get one more battle star that came out a little bit earlier. I'm going to take a break from the chair. I got wound up there. Unique job. I was in headquarters of the battalion. I was a corporal. I had a tech sergeant over me and a lieutenant over him. And both of those guys could care less about the investigation. The one guy was living with a countess, and the other guy was, I don't know where to be found, but they sound all the papers. And I took care of the cases and assigned, uh, I had seven Italian policemen and seven GIs that I would have as teams, two-man teams, to go out and investigate, and then bring them in. So I have this one, a little Italian guy brings his daughter in one day with a GI, and the three of them are there, and I said, what's the problem? And the Italian guy says, it's a man, he made my daughter pregnant. He said, he got my daughter pregnant. And uh, I said, well, did you, you know, fool around with it? Well, yeah, he says, everybody in our outfit did, but my outfit's all in the 7th Army. They went and invaded southern France. I happened to be in the hospital. He said, but she was common ground for everybody, and I, they just wanted a trip to the United States. And I said, well, we're, uh, uh, what do you want to do? He said, well, I'll give her my address, <clears throat> and uh, I'm not going to marry her. He says, I'll give her my address, and she can write to my mother and she'll send her some money and some clothes for the baby. I said, okay, where do you live? He says, Schenectady. I said, Schenectady, New York. I said, that's where I'm from. And so anyway, we record this, and that's the way the case ended, because the government wouldn't make him marry her. And uh, most of them were really prostitutes looking for a trip to the United States or a cash settlement. Mm -hmm. But then the other one was a couple of GIs that got in a confrontation in a park, which was really populated by all the prostitutes in Naples, and they're on their way home from the infantry. They didn't know each other, they weren't friends, and they get in a big hassle over a couple hundred bucks that was in a cigarette case, a plastic cigarette case. So they come before me, and I, I acted like a judge, to Judge Judy at the time, and um, I said, well, and they both claimed ownership to this thing. 
I says, well, where did you get it? He says, well, I bought it on Via Roma. He says, oh, yeah. I says, well, do you, have a, you don't have a receipt. No, I said, I don't have a receipt. So I, I determined that the one kid had owned a, a cigarette case. And I said, how do you know? He says, well, there's a few little cigarette particles down in the corner there. And I, I, that was, uh, so I turned to one GI home. I said, why are you guys making a federal case out of this when you're both going home? You know you're not going to settle it. And they both claimed ownership. And the one guy swore his girlfriend was very up and up and very honest. I says, are you out of your mind? I says, how long have you known her? He says, two days. Two days. I said, he just met her two nights ago. And he's, he wants to give up. I says, I'm throwing it out. I says, just take your cigarette case, get out of here and get on your boat and get home. So there, there were, I had a lot of interesting ones like that in the investigation part where the other guys were just pulling guard duty and uh, doing the routine job. But uh, mine was extremely interesting. But uh, we had all kinds of money available uh, on the black market. I had $100,000 in envelopes in a, in, a, in a trunk next to my desk that the government, nobody would know about. We had to turn it into army finance. You know, we had raided a truck. One night we lost five two and a half ton trucks off the port. It disappeared completely, truck and all. Uh, sugar was selling for eight bucks a pound, flour, eight bucks a pound. Uh, cigarettes, uh, $20, $22 a carton. We were paying a nickel a pack, 50 cents a carton. Um, flour, sugar, coffee, eight bucks a pound, and two and a half ton trucks, five of them disappear one night. Well, we got a lead on one and we pick up the guy and what they would do is they would pre-sell all the products that were gonna be distributed off that truck. And when the truck would pull into a place, they would, uh, in an olive grove or something, they would break it right down. Everybody would take what they bought, paid in advance, and they would all take off. So when you grabbed anybody, you would only have two or three pounds of sugar, a couple of pounds of coffee, or a few cartons of cigarettes, and you wouldn't have any big case. But we would accumulate money like crazy, the, the, the black market money. And uh, one night I'm on CQ, and they, a couple of MPs come in, hey, Bill, count this. We're going over for coffee. And they throw a bag on my desk with money, about 8,000 bucks. I mean, they, they handle it like, like paper. And I, I put it all in front. I had about $100,000 in those folders that we had turned into Army Finance. Then I also was in charge of all the confiscated weapons south of Rome, down to Sicily. Burke guns, machine guns, uh, Lugers, P-38 pistols, Mausers, Berettas, all these guns, a, a real a, a trove of treasure and all in the closet. And um, I, didn't, I wasn't interested. I wish I had kept I, I took a P-38 and a Luger, lost the Luger in a crap game, and again, <laughs> gave the P-38 away to a friend, friend from Vermont. But that, that, that's part of the history. It was, a, it was interesting. I, I had interesting work. So you saw a whole aspect of the war that, uh, that people don't normally see or read about. They wouldn't have any idea what the MPs did. Uh, oh, well, and I had a better job than the, uh, than the company guys because they were they went up to Livorno and uh, Leghorn and they pulled guard duty up there aboard the ships. And uh, no, I, I was in investigation in the headquarters. It was neat. It was a nice job. I did see quite an aspect of it. Uh, a, a Italian comes in one day and says he has a trip ticket, you know, from a GI truck. What happened? He says, well, this truck smashed into his building. And I said, well, where'd you get the trip ticket? He said, the driver gave me that. I said, the driver never gave you that. I said, that's his authorization for the vehicle. He says, he would never give that away. It's like giving his registration away. I said, you got to tell me the truth or I'm not going to do anything for you. No, no, that's the truth. That's the truth. No, I said, he didn't give you that. So I called the GI. He said, no, I never gave him that. I wondered what happened to that. I said, well, case out of court. <laughs> See, I just... And it was interesting to have that kind of authority, mm -hmm. is, is what, uh, what is coming to play now with our American police system, is the policeman is the judge, the jury, and the prosecutor, uh, when he pulls you over for a traffic ticket, he can either let you go, or he can fine you, or he can throw the book at you, and he's the judge, in a way. Did you see a lot of organized crime activity in there? When you call it organized, you mean mafiosa type mm -hmm. of thing? No, Italy works on a system of, of uh, respect and uh, deference to anybody above you. When we first went in, uh, you know, a corporal, you go into a building, and they'd click their heels and they'd salute you. Everybody was King Tut. 
and then after a while, it, it kind of we didn't exercise our authority and expect that reverence, and uh, we didn't get it after a while. In fact, uh, another sad case: we were there about a month in the University of Naples. Of this captain from Texas, he was a tough cookie. He was a good officer, good, good, good soldier, but he was tough. You had to either do it or you're going to be court-martialed. And uh, but he was he was good to serve under. You know he was going to take care of you. So one day he walks down the street and he said, "Time, bang, bang, knock into him, knock him off." He comes back to headquarters and I happen to be on guard duty. He says, "O'Connor, wait till tomorrow." He says, "They may not respect me. They they may not like me, but they'll respect me." Which means the next day he walks down the street and Italian's reading the paper, bangs right into him. Bing! He KO'd him right out the street, knocked him flat. He walking out. Bing! He hits the second one. Bing! He goes up. So this guy was a tough cookie. So he comes back and says, "Wait till tomorrow." When he when he goes out the next day, Tiny's were running across the street to walk on the other side. They gave him the whole sidewalk. He said, "They don't like me," but he said, "Guy, my God!" He said, "They respect me," you know. And that was his belief. That's the way he believed. And but that was kind of the attitude. When you were asked about organized crime, it's all a system of payola. It seems to me in Naples. Naples is still as corrupt as ever, I think. I don't know, more so than Marseille, France, or Lyon, or whatever other towns would have a port, port cities. But um, there was a system. There was a system. We could, and we had to work within the system. And that's why I understand the police problem of today. That uh, when we had to get things, we had a valve pack stolen out of one of the uh, vehicles going through Piazza Garibaldi. The kids would reach right in and grab it. Well, an army command car was wide open. They just grabbed this valve pack. And we wanted it back because there was aerial photographs in there that were important. So we, I put a couple of guys on it, Italian GI and Italian policemen. They go down to Piazza Garibaldi, and they work within the underground of the kids, bring them some coffee, bring them some donuts, pay them off. And by morning, we had it back. Uh, but they had to work within the system, and they, hey, Giovanni, tell Giovanni, we want this stuff, and okay, you pay, you do this, you do that, and through the thing. Uh, if you talk about a system, that's that's what it was. We got one night, the uh, Red Cross nurse, a uh, Red Cross worker came in, and she had lost her suitcase. And I said, well, I'll see what we can do. I put a couple guys on it. We got it all back except the carton of cigarettes and one or two little things. and. I call her up. I was thrilled. I said, "We got most of your stuff back. It was lingerie and you know nothing important." And she said, "Oh, that's very nice of you." She said, "Would you send it up to my hotel? Send it up? She didn't even come down again. I could have thrown it at her, but we used our contacts to get this back, and she didn't seem to hardly even appreciate it. But those kind of cases were interesting, very interesting. But that's how you learn what happens in the system. Well, what was going on? With, what kind of problems would you have with American troops? behind the lines. What kind of trouble would they be getting into? Well, black market was the big thing. You could always make a pretty good buck. Even our MPs were working in the black market. They would sell some stuff. They, a lot of our MPs, I don't want to use ethnic uh, references, uh, would supply a lot of stuff. There's some, some in strictly in friendship ways, of family and relatives, different thing. Everybody had relatives there. Um, Black Mark was a big thing. We had murders, we had rapes, we had armed robberies, um, everything, everything in the books. The drunk and disorderly was just the, the lowest form, but uh, stolen vehicles, they take, see, of course, the Jeeps wouldn't have keys, right? They just had a little toggle switch, and we were supposed to take the rotor out, you know, take the distributor cap off and take the rotor out, and, and, and that would be your key, in a way. And then. Uh, nobody should steal your vehicle. Well, we had a military police vehicle stolen right in front of headquarters. You know, the infantry guys came back, they didn't care. They, in fact, they just would be thrown in jail, probably. But uh, the lines were, it was a very difficult war from uh, October through May and June till Casino and Anzio broke and we took Rome. Uh, the, uh, the Gardliano and the Rapido River and the Volturno, they were horrible, horrible battles and an awful lot of lost lives. In a way, I, I don't know whether it was necessary. I don't know whether Mark Clark was the greatest general in the world. But. Did you have more trouble with combat soldiers coming back to the rear? Or <laughs> one, of the, one of the big problems we had 
was breaking up fights between the infantry officers and the Air Force officers. When they'd come down from Foggia and Barry to go to Capri, the infantry took Capri, and the Air Force requisitioned it and took it over. And the Air Force had the Isle of Capri for their rest center, and the infantry didn't have it. And, uh, and they had a couple clubs. One, one was the Orange Grove the, in Naples, and the infantry officers had come back, held bent for election, and uh, the, you know, the fly boys had come down. They needed each other in the war, and they respected each other and uh, uh, accepted each other, but when they were back in the back of lines, uh, there was a lot of animosity there, but uh, I guess it went by. Uh, between the ground troops, they, they had a tough life. They had a tough life. The Air Force would have dangerous missions. They'd come back to Foji and have the quarter liquor and have their parties and good meals and warm beds and that sort of thing, and the infantry would be up there for 30 days. But uh, that winter, when they sent back to our outfits, we had to cut 10 men and send them up to the lines. And uh, a few of them got killed. I visited the American Cemetery in Florence, Italy this summer and visited two of my buddies that are still there. Uh, and it was, they're, they're tragic stories, uh, why they didn't come back. And of course, it's a very subjective thing when you talk about soldiering. You wouldn't send your best soldiers up. And, uh, you'd send the guys that were the drinkers and didn't show up for duty and one thing or another. And uh, they went up to the lines. And, if you, and if they didn't soldier behind the lines, they didn't soldier well up on the lines. And who can say that that's why they got killed? But they did get killed. Uh, you feel a big loss. I, I felt very close to the war when I visited their graves. They, they gave up their lives for me to have 58 good years, real good years. So where did you go after Naples? We went into Rome the day Rome fell, June 6, 44. Well, I think they say the 4th, but we went in on the 6th. We went up to Anzio, and then we moved into Rome. And there's when I saw one of the big uh, wartime atrocities. I'm on headquarters on CQ, and a little Italian undertaker comes into me and gets asks me for permission to uh, investigate a cemetery, uh, a grave. And I says, well, sure, go ahead. It doesn't matter to me. It's all Italian people. So uh, I tell my buddy, hey, Wager, come on. We'll get a vehicle. We'll go out and see this. So we go down to a place called Ardentine Caves, the Ardentine Caves in um, Viapia. And we go in there, and Wager and I walk into this building about the size of a, bigger than a living room. And we walk around the pile of bodies that have been buried for three months since they, March, March 44, the Germans uh, assassinated 320 Italian civilians. Do you know this story, you know? Go ahead, tell us. Uh, uh, what happened? Uh, cells of communist groups, uh, the clandestine 13, the Red Brigades and four others that were all fighting for power. And, but these communists were underground and fighting, and the, and the Vatican actually had a better relationship with the Germans than they did with the communists. They were afraid of the communists after the war. They could see this political thing coming. And so they went along with the Germans in quite a bit of the way. And uh, one day, the Italians plant a, a barrel full of dynamite on the street as SS troops are marching by to uh, change guards, and it blows up. and kills 30-some uh, SS troops, 30, 32 of them. And um, they decide that immediately they want revenge. Kesseling was the general, and uh, there's a whole bunch of other guys in there. The colonel, I can't think of it, the German colonel, was in charge of the SS there. They want 10 civilian hostages for every German they lost. So they're going to take 300 hostages, and they go out to the prison, the Italian jail, and they take them all. They took priests, children, Italian, civilians, Jewish, everybody. It wasn't a, a Jewish issue, but a lot of Jews were in jail at the time, and they did lose 50 or 60 Jewish people, 100. And they take them out, and they just machine gun them. If you ever want to read Massacre in Rome, it's a heck of a story, and most people don't even know this story. They machine gun them, they bring them into this cave, they're all manacled and, and tied with ropes, and they dump them in a pile, pile, pile. And finally, when they get done killing the 320, they blow up the cave, and, and they caved it in. 
So Wager and I go out there, and they had been digging, they had cleared it out, but can you imagine, I wouldn't think of doing it now, but these bodies have been there for three months, since March, via Rosselli in Rome, March, April, May, June, they had been buried, and, and we walk around their bodies, that stink like anything. So we run around the bodies and out again, and he's visited, uh, my buddy has visited since, and there's quite a memorial to them now. Fossi Ardentine, it's called, in, in Rome. And uh, there's still a dispute uh, of whether or not the Pope could have intervened. It went all the way to Hitler. Hitler said, no, you know, kill him. Kesseling, the general there in Italy, uh, I guess he, he approved it too. But it was a interesting story, the way uh, they had to get drunk to shoot these people, just shoot them. Uh, and, uh, that was one of the cases that we investigated, uh, but it was totally civilian. It was a war crimes trial, and they did convict um, the colonel that was in charge. And I could look it up in here, but um, and he was in jail. He got life, and he's in jail in Italy. And ten years ago, he's dying of cancer, and his wife comes in and she spirits him out of the Italian jail in a suitcase. I believe that story or not, that's written up here too. He was down to like 85 pounds or something, and she brought her big suitcase, and she used to bring him clothing, and she brought him food, and just one thing or another. Well, I think, to this day, that there was some payoff in there, you know, with the police, and she got him out, but the story was that he got out in a suitcase. And Italy wanted him back again to have him go back to jail and die in jail. But Germany and Italy didn't have an extradition clause or treaty, and uh, he died in, in Germany. But uh, the, the, those stories are, we, I keep getting little s uh, snippets of information on them, and I, I save them. Someday somebody's going to read them and wonder what I've been saving. <laughs> but it's an interesting story. How did you feel when you, when you realized that you were there in the middle of an atrocity system? You well, you're 19 year old, uh, it just rolls kind of off you. You knew it happened. There was no GIs involved. I would have felt a lot worse if it was the Malmedy massacre in France there where the Germans killed all our American soldiers. But I can understand the police mentality easier than other people can understand it. I'm not defending it, and I don't maybe agree with it, but you're expected to rise above human emotions when these things happen. Coventry, England was bombed by Germany. England knew it was going to be bombed, right? And uh, it was pretty well destroyed. Well, when, the Ger when Britain got on top of the air war, they bombed the hell out of Berlin. For what reason? It was mostly vindictive, just to get even. Um, many of our troops uh, in, in the Pacific, in, in Vietnam, My Lai Massacre. Uh, to, to, whether or not uh, there was any purpose in shooting all the civilians or not, they, they just had their belly fill. And, and it's, it's hard to understand vindictiveness and uh, human emotions that if you're taking a pasting by somebody and finally you get a chance to get your licks in, what is enough? You know, I, all right, I hit him a few times now, that's good enough. Or you're going to pummel him to death, you know? And so that, that's hard to understand. Also, the temptation for graft and greed. We had that in the MPs. We had a case where uh, a GI comes into me one day when I'm on CQ in Naples. He was furious. He says, my, my, he was getting married in Naples, and they had invited some relatives from Rome. And at the time, there was only one road coming down from Rome, Route 7, and we had an MP roadblock on that road. And this one in the course of investigation, we realized this one MP, nobody wanted to work with him. And he was extorting money from the Italian civilians. So this vehicle comes down with Italian civilians, and this GI says, uh, you got anything on this vehicle, American? If, if they had spark plugs or tires or anything at all American, we could uh, confiscate it. It was American. They couldn't possibly buy it. And the guy says, no, it's all Italian. It was a Fiat. A lot of he says, what about the inner tubes? On the inner tubes. He said, they're Italian. They're Italian. Well, he says, I, uh, how can I be sure they're Italian? He says, I want you to kick the air out. Let me see those inner tubes. But he says, how will I put the air back in? I don't have a pump. Well, he says, that's your problem. He says, I can investigate the... So anyway, he said, well, what's it going to cost me? 30, 40 bucks? He gave him 40 bucks. And that's what this guy had been doing, extorting money. 
And when this GI, when he, this Italian gets down to Naples and tells his future American soldier that he had to pay the MPs, he was, he was furious. Well, we, of course, we investigated. The guy got, you know, we arrested him and he served some time. But uh, at the time, uh, there were so many guys in jail that, that we had to reclaim some of them. We had 5,000 GIs in Naples alone in jail. When we went through Rome, we lost 5,000 AWOLs that went over the hill when in Rome. Maybe some of them came back in two or three days, a week, you know, but when they'd been in combat and they finally took Rome and the, and the war didn't end, when they thought the war would end when we took Naples, and it didn't end. And then it didn't end when we took Rome. The, the, the Po Valley was another year. Oh. We took Rome June 6, 44, and the, Rome did, uh, the war didn't end until May 45. So it was another year. And my one, one poor buddy got killed three weeks before the war ended in April. But anyway, that's, that's the life. So where'd you go after Rome? After Rome, I went back to Naples. The other guys, one company went up through the Po Valley, and uh, one company went into Livorno, or Leghorn. And I stayed in Naples in headquarters until the VE and VJ day. And then um, in November 45, when the war was over, they, they regathered the troops all together in Naples when we got on the carrier wasp to come home. And uh, that was a happy day. We, were, we spent uh, Thanksgiving of 45 in Naples in the replacement depot. But uh, we didn't care well, uh, whether we ate or not. We got aboard the ship. 5,000 GIs aboard the carrier wasp, 3,000 Navy men. I don't know how they fed 8,000 guys for five days, but we only ate two meals a day. We got up and for breakfast, ate breakfast about 10 o'clock, washed our mess kit, and then we took an hour off and then got in line for dinner. Ate dinner about 3 or 4 o'clock, and that was it. Two meals a day, crap games all day long, lost all your, all your money. <laughs> But it was a good trip home. We wound up in Hampton Roads, Virginia, two days here, and then go up to um, Camp Dix, and we got discharged and got on the train and came home after three years together. It's interesting. Now, what, what happened to you after the war? Well, that was another interesting occurrence. Uh, we're in the uh, camp in the tent, and a Schenectady kid from Mount Pleasant High School comes in to visit my three buddies and myself, we were still together, and he was information and education non-com for Camp Dix. And he says to one guy, what are you going to do when you get out? He said, I'm going back to college. He had one year at SUNY at State University of New York. And then he said to the other kid, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to go to RPI. He says, I had an apprentice course. Now I can afford to go to college on the GI Bill. Third kid, he said, what are you going to do? He says, I'm going to work. I don't want to go to school. I don't I don't know, go back to work. He said, why don't you go to college? I said, where would I go? He said, well, you always like to draw and you could letter and you're a battalion artist and this and that. He said, why don't you go to an art school? That's a good idea. He said, well, I got two books on Pratt Institute in the camp. He said, I'll give you one, look at it on your way home. So I look at it on my way home. When I get home, I tell everybody, I think I'll go to Pratt. And he said, good idea. So I, I go down and apply for Pratt. And uh, I applied for the advertising design program, two year certificate. And the dean looked at my transcript and he says, you have a very nice high school diploma. He says, you have a regent's diploma from a parochial school. I said, well, I didn't even know that. I thought it was a general diploma. He says, you have regents. He said, why don't you become an art teacher? I said, I didn't know they had art teachers either. We didn't have one at parochial high school. He says, go over to the other school and see if you'd like to take a four-year degree course and uh, become a teacher. And uh, I went over there and that's where I met my wife. So we are married 49 years, 50 years next year. So. So all of those things put together has given me a, a lot of payback for the war because I certainly didn't suffer. I, uh, I was one of the fortunate ones that came out quite a bit ahead. It was a good, good experience for me. Speak, uh, I speak enough Italian, France, French to get by over there, had a good time. We went to Italy again this summer, visited the National Cemetery outside of Rome, outside of Florence. There's one at Anzio with 7,500 guys, and one outside of Florence with 4,500 guys. And I look at those and say, yeah, well, I was lucky. Yeah. How, uh, when you're over in Italy now, um, it, it must be very different, of course. You know? well, 
Oh, it was long over with. Oh, yeah. yeah. But, and, uh, do the Italians still remember? I got a sense this time that we went back to Italy in 66, and this is the second time I've been back. I got more of a sense that they're not enthusiastic about talking about the war. I don't think they're happy with their experience in the war. I think they got sandbagged by Mussolini. They paid a very severe price for a lot of devastation, a lot of destruction, and I, I, I sense that uh, don't don't exploit it, Bill. Just you know, take a very like Casino bombing Monte Casino, They're losing their Abbey. Um, Naples took a horrible pounding for six months before we went in by Germans, but we pounded Naples, and then when we captured Naples, they pounded us for six months. So Naples took a pretty good pounding. Leghorn, Livorno was one of the most bombed cities in Italy, uh, the port there, because we were using that port. So uh, all in all, I think they just don't forget the war. I suppose the Germans would too. Of course, they both lost. Italy's uh, political uh, life after the war is interesting because um, I just finished a book, uh, The Secret Surrender by Alan Dulles. Uh, about the, the Germans that wanted to surrender in northern Italy toward the last month or two of the war. They just didn't want to waste any more of their German troops, and we didn't want to waste any more of ours. And they were negotiating in Switzerland, and actually they came all the way down to Caserta, Italy, down where we were. I didn't know the Germans were there at the time, but they flew them in and were negotiating for a surrender. But the German generals would not break their code of allegiance to Hitler. They had sworn allegiance. And I think they're also afraid of their necks, because if, if he found out that they had negotiated a surrender of the Italian campaign, uh, he would have killed them. He, what the hell, he killed 20 or 30 other generals in the, uh, you know, when they tried to kill him. He hung them and slaughtered them. So they just wouldn't give up. But the minute uh, Hitler committed suicide, then Hitler, the, the German, and that was a problem, that many, that many uh, prisoners of war when you take in a million and a half troops as prisoners and have to supply medical and food, that becomes a big problem. People don't realize, you know, even the African campaign, we had 100,000 guys we had to feed every day, three meals a day. They were eating better than we were, actually. We used to sneak into the prisoner of war camp to steal bread, the GIs, you know, but uh, it, it, it's, it's a uh, part of the war that people don't realize. And, if you look back now, what stands out the most? What impression has lasted the longest? Well, probably my good fortune, my marriage, my three great children. And, and my wife doesn't think I'll ever forget World War II, and I probably won't, because, uh, and I'm a collector, and uh, I have all the photos and all the memorabilia and the, the letters that I wrote home, and uh, my friendships that we made, those three guys, we're still together 55, 58 years later get together for dinner and go to their camps. I'll, I'll meet one of them Friday down in Virginia on the way to Florida. Uh, I, I came out pretty pretty nice. Why why have those friendships stayed so close? A couple of times, and in that one article that was in the newspaper, we had common values. We had common respect for each other, common interest. We all had commonality. I knew Wall a little bit before I went in. Don, Walt, and Bud knew each other, and we wind up in the same company. We just gravitated together. We had the, the we don't over drink, we don't over gamble. Uh, we liked to uh, dance and party. We, we double dated, what, well, 55 years now, so. And we, we get together for a lot of laughs about the war. <laughs> One guy doesn't think he's in the same outfit as we were because the stories come out so, so different, you know, but. Uh, that's some funny stories. Uh, I, uh, one night I'm on guard duty, uh, I'm on patrol before I went into headquarters. And uh, in Piazza Garibaldi, a truck's going up the line and a, a, a whole carton of comforters fall off. And it really fell off the truck. Believe me, that's true. So it falls off the truck and there's five there. So the other kid that is on duty with me directing traffic in Piazza, we flip a coin, and I win three out of five. So he takes two, and I take three. So I bring him back to the University of Naples, where we're billeted, and I got three for four guys. So I says, he says, because you're the one that you got him, you know. No, no, I said, we'll, we'll divide them up fair and square. We'll flip coins, odd man, you know, doesn't, 
I didn't get one. <laughs> Sanctuary got a comforter, but that's that's how close we were. We were pretty close. And you still are. Oh yeah, yeah, we had a good time, good time. And that that's probably one of the things that stand out. And my good fortune of meeting my wife. We were we were in Germany this summer. <clears throat> we had a great trip this summer. And we go to Hitler's Hofbrau house, and we took a picture of it because that's where my good fortune started when Hitler, in, in 1933, made his big Munich push, uh, his uh, overthrow of the German uh, government. And I said, that's where my, my history started. So we took a picture of this and we gave it to our children and said, this is where Daddy Obama, whole thing started. <laughs> this so you feel the war really changed your life? Oh, yeah, dramatically, yeah. And, uh, I would want another war. I would, I can't envision any other war being as world war as that one was. I think of World War One. we were in there about a year and a half, right? April 1917 to November 1918. This one we're in from 41 to 45. Actually, we're in 1940 when the draft started, but uh, we are in about five years. But as I said, the British Eighth Army, when you talk of World War, Zealand, the Poland, French, Spanish, Italian, they even had the battalion of Italian reconstructed troops in the Italian army and the German and the British Eighth Army. But uh, this Irish, English, Scotch, Wales, everybody was represented, the, the Yugoslavs, and we worked with all of them. But that was really a world war. I, I would never want to see another I don't know what the next war will be like. But this was an experience. Was this war worth it? Pardon? Was the war worth it? Oh, there's no question. There's no, Hitler had to be stopped. I mean, nobody, very few people have dealt that. Although I met German uh, soldiers that uh, would uh, become citizens of the United States, and I got really good friends with them. You know, they're, they're good guys. And they still aren't opposed to Hitler. Now, Hitler was good for Germany. They don't agree with the Jewish issue, with the Holocaust. They say that was wrong, that was wrong. But as far as Hitler was for the German people, same as Mussolini for the Italian people. He did an awful lot of good. He cleared the Pontine marshes, he organized the schools, he, he did a lot of good for Italy. They just went beyond what, what, uh, what was expected and uh, they paid a, a very severe price. Uh, yeah, was the war worth it? It certainly was. You have to understand the mentality of the country at the time. 98% were behind that war. 98, 99, maybe. It's connected. You didn't do anything that wasn't for the war effort. You didn't buy an extra pair of stockings or an extra pack of cigarettes or anything to boys overseas. And it was really support. When, of course, it was a different era. When you think of uh, the telephone communications in this day and age, in Texas, when we were down there, we'd wait for Sunday when we could go down the post exchange and the telephone exchange had a, a building. And we'd go in there, we'd sign up to get a call into home, 8 o'clock in the morning. Then we'd go out and have breakfast and go to church and come back and we'd wait all day long trying to get a phone call through. And most of the time we didn't. I don't know whether I got one call or two calls through in seven months I was down there. To home. Mother's Day would be out, Easter would be out of the question. You would never get a call through the telephone lines. It was the old, it wasn't the communication system they have now. But that type of thing has changed the existence as compared to what we knew. Well, I think we're getting down towards the end of the tape. Sure. So is there anything else you'd like to add, Bill? Well, I thank you for your interest and uh, to hear my story. And uh, I do hope somebody in the future gain some historical value out of it. Uh, there's a good book out, I was telling one of the other fellows here, that um, Gone for a Soldier. They're uh, resurrected uh, letters from Civil War. They were come up in 1962. Uh, 1962, yeah, 1862. It was 100 years later, these war letters from Civil War by a story. And uh, it's a very interesting book to read about 100 years later. Did you feel like similar experience? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, his war in 1862, when they could pay to get out or pay to somebody else to take your place, uh, their provisions, the way they were supplied, the battles they fought were so different than World War II. 
and our, our battles were so different than Vietnam and Korea and Kosovo and the Desert Storm. Right, but no. when you read the book about the Civil War, did you feel like there were some common experiences? Yeah, being a lowly private, yeah, a, a, a homesick and that sort of thing. But in this year, when we were in an integrated outfit like we were in with so many Snectadians, because their mother would hear from their son and call my mother, and there was a real good communication. So mine wasn't quite as bad as some other guys. I really still marvel at the infantry and the people that really fought the war. You know, fought. I didn't fight the war as bad. I brought in one German one night that uh, uh, escaped from our prisoner of war compound in Salerno. Uh, the prisoner of war compound initially is just a little trip wire and they put him in a field to keep him. And uh, he, uh, he, he got straight away. He didn't escape. He still was in his second lieutenant uniform, German officer. And he was afraid to be seen by the Italians and afraid to be seen by the Americans. Everybody would shoot him probably. So he took him three days to work his way back up to Naples at night. And then he turned himself into his girlfriend. We are in the town of Bagnoli, which is right outside of Naples, and uh, where Sophie Loren is from. And so he turns himself and tells his girlfriend to go get the American police and tell him that I want to turn myself in. Well, I happen to be on guard duty on the, on, on the gate. And I broke all the rules I had been trained for. I left my post. I didn't call the sergeant my guard. I leave my post. She says, so an Italian GI from our office goes by. I said, do you speak Italian? He says, yeah. So I ask her what she wants. He says, got a German prisoner down there. I says, OK. So I take her up to the comment down of the camp. And he's a bad moment. See, he gets an interpreter there. And they bring out a dossier. They got the whole guy's whole story there and his picture and everything. He said, you want to go down and pick him up? I said, yeah. I had a Thompson submachine gun. I said, yeah, I'll go down and pick him up. So I walked down the street and they said, I'll shoot him if he runs. Well, no, 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 she didn't want to go. They had fallen in love and he, he wanted to get back to her house and turn himself in. He just wanted to live. So anyway, the other guys didn't have that experience. <laughs> so that's the only German I really encountered. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Hey, thanks a lot.